Kubernetes as universal infrastructure control plane. Kubernetes is generally related to as a piece of software that is pretty much useful for orchestrating and managing containerized applications. However, Kubernetes by its inherent extensibility is useful even to manage infrastructure outside of a Kubernetes cluster. I am Raghuraman Balakchandran and I am a co-founder at Invisible Cloud where we offer Gravity, a self-service Kubernetes platform that simplifies the developer experience for Kubernetes, while DevOps teams and central teams can use Gravity to standardize Kubernetes across the organization. So Kubernetes operators are useful to perform custom automations that are not natively offered by the Kubernetes APIs available out of the box of any Kubernetes cluster. So what we can do is, so if you have, let's say, some kind of a custom automation that we want to run, then we can write our own operators where we define what the uh, spec or the schema looks like through a custom resource definition. And then uh, when the user creates a custom resource, uh, the user provides essentially a desired set of inputs that is required for the custom resource to be created. And then we have a piece of logic that takes those inputs and then performs whatever automation that is required. While you may not have written an operator by yourself, uh, you're very likely to have used a lot of operators. So whenever you install any kind of add-on to a Kubernetes cluster, they essentially are operators uh, written by respective vendors. So operators allows us to perform these kind of custom automations, right? So why not we use these operators to even manage cloud resources? Why should we use uh, a third party tool to even orchestrate cloud resources such as a database or, a, uh, or an object store and so on and so forth. So we can use Kubernetes uh, to orchestrate cloud resources through these custom operators. And the key benefit is that users can use then the familiar Kubernetes based models like writing the YAML definitions, like how you would write for a deployment or a, an ingress or a pod. And in the same fashion, you can actually even provision uh, cloud resources, right? And then you can manage them using the rich set of tools available within the Kubernetes ecosystem. So in, in the past, there have been uh, attempts made to uh, uh, achieve this from a Kubernetes uh, cluster itself. So one of the earliest implementations were uh, done on uh, using uh, the Kubernetes service catalog API, where you can have an open service broker implementation uh, to, uh, to provision cloud resources uh, through uh, Kubernetes itself, right? And uh, currently, uh, today, all the cloud providers offer uh, their own uh, specific operators. So for example, AWS offers uh, something called as ACK, which is AWS own controller for Kubernetes. Azure has uh, something called as Azure service operator and uh, GCP has GCP config uh, connector. So all of them are uh, uh, custom operators provided by the specific cloud provider where you can use these operators, install them on the cluster, and then uh, provision respective cloud services through these uh, operators. One of the other interesting things that is happening uh, in various organizations currently is what is called as the rise of uh, platform teams, right? So many organizations are building internal platform teams where these platform teams are tasked with building abstractions where uh, these abstractions are offered as shared services to developers. And the abstractions actually take care of implementing a lot of these best practices, policies, and guardrails, right? So for example, uh, if uh, a developer needs, let's say a database or a queuing service or a messaging service, then the platform team actually builds these kind of abstraction and offers it to developers where developers simply say, okay, I just need this queue and uh, the service actually takes care of provisioning the actual infrastructure. Developers on the other hand, uh, expect a self-service uh, way of consuming these abstractions where they can simply use a self-service experience to provision infrastructure so that they can actually move fast without being limited by uh, DevOps teams bandwidth and so on and so forth. And the key thing is they don't want to deal with the infrastructure directly uh, where they'll have to be required to provide a lot of configurations and parameters, right? Uh, this is exactly where uh, Crossplane uh, comes into the picture, uh, right? So Crossplane is an open source project 
where it can be used uh, to orchestrate any cloud infrastructure from a Kubernetes cluster, right? So cross plane of uh, uh, exists as what's called as an universal control plane, and using cross plane, platform teams can actually compose various abstractions and uh, offer them to developers. And these abstractions hide away all the complexities of provisioning uh, the infrastructure. And the abstraction can actually also implement all the guardrails and policies and controls that is required by a particular organization. And developers, when they want to provision an infrastructure, they simply use these abstractions. And the key thing is that they can use the same Kubernetes style declarative way of defining the infrastructure and provision those infrastructure directly. And Crossplane uh, has out of the box support for all the major cloud providers. And you can pretty much uh, provision any cloud uh, service through Crossplane currently. So uh, let's dive a little bit deeper into Crossplane. And uh, at a high level, there are six uh, major building blocks that uh, Crossplane offers. Uh, we will dive into each one of them to understand what they are and how we can use them to uh, compose our uh, infrastructure. So before I uh, dive into those concepts, so let's look at a simple uh, use case. So let's say uh, a platform team wants to offer uh, a simple PostgreSQL uh, service or an abstraction uh, where the service takes care of a lot of these configurations and uh, the developers simply specify what is the required storage and in which cloud provider they would want the PostgreSQL instance to be created. And the rest of the configurations, uh, everything will be automatically taken care by this particular uh, PostgreSQL abstraction that the platform team is offering. So with that as, a con uh, as the context, so let's look at how we can use Crossplane uh, to offer such an abstraction or a service. So the first concept is uh, uh, providers. So providers, as the name suggests, are the actual infrastructure providers. So these are the actual cross-plane packages that gets installed on a cluster, and it deals with the actual cloud service APIs whenever a particular resource needs to be created. So uh, in this example, uh, uh, you can simply install, for example, a provider AWS, which has all the required managed resources, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Uh, and uh, it can be used to create any resource within the AWS uh, uh, cloud. The next uh, uh, building block is uh, called as managed uh, resource, right? A managed resource uh, within Crossplane actually represents an external resource such as a cloud service, right? So it could be uh, an RDS instance or a, a GCP's Cloud SQL instance, uh, any uh, AWS or a GCP or an Azure service, right, for example. And uh, this is a fundamental core building block that can be used to create a corresponding uh, cloud services, right? So what you see here on the right side is uh, uh, where you can create an RDS instance by specifying various uh, properties. And when you apply this YAML, a corresponding RDS instance actually gets created. So while uh, you can directly create a cloud resource through managed resources, most people will not use this directly because most of the time we would want a higher level abstraction that takes care of even composing other required infrastructure as well, right? Okay, and that's where compositions come into picture. And we start composing infrastructure through compositions. And the first step to do that is to define something called as a composite resource definition. Uh, XRD in short, right? So an XRD uh, essentially has uh, the spec or the schema that uh, defines what kind of uh, composite resources exist uh, within the system. And uh, it can be used to uh, create various uh, resources uh, downstream, right? So think of uh, XRD is uh, uh, very similar to the Kubernetes custom resource definitions, if you have uh, dealt with that before. Or if you are, let's say, coming from uh, the Terraform world, uh, XRDs can be thought of similar to uh, a variable blocks that you will have in a typical uh, TF uh, module. So here is a, a simple example for a composite resource definition. So in this case, uh, for our PostgreSQL example, so we are defining a kind called as X PostgreSQL instance. 
and simply we are defining this spec of this composite resource definition. So this is again left to the uh, platform team, right? So they're actually creating a custom uh, definition and uh, this spec can be defined as they are going to uh, define uh, the actual abstraction. So in this case, uh, we are defining a spec which simply uh, expects uh, the storage uh, GB uh, as the parameter from the uh, end user, right? Okay, so now we have a spec. Then the next step is to actually uh, create uh, different compositions. So uh, a composition essentially allows us to create uh, various resources in the form of uh, a composition, right? So you compose various resources using a composition and these can be uh, used by Crossplane to create the actual underlying resources. So the, the composition in turn creates the corresponding managed resources such as the RDS instance or a Cloud SQL instance in the respective uh, cloud provider. So as a platform team, uh, what we will be essentially doing is uh, creating different types of compositions. So whatever abstractions we want to offer, we will create different variants of that abstraction through compositions, right? So in our example of uh, trying to offer a PostgreSQL instance, we could have a production Postgres, uh, which uh, automatically configures high availability and encryption, uh, while a dev Postgres composition uh, restricts, let's say, instance types to, let's say, small or medium, right? So like that, we can uh, create different flavors of our composition and offer them to uh, developers to actually provision the resources. So a composition can be thought of something similar to a Terraform module or a Helm template that is used to uh, define how a particular resource will get provisioned. So for our example of uh, trying to offer an abstraction for creating PostgreSQL instance on both AWS and GCP, a platform team essentially creates two compositions, but both of them, if you see, uh, are uh, of kind X PostgreSQL instance. This is also of X PostgreSQL instance, and the uh, GCP one is also of X PostgreSQL instance. But where they differ is that in the AWS case, the actual underlying managed resource that is getting created is of kind RDS instance, whereas on the GCP side, the managed resource is actually a Cloud SQL instance. Then, as part of the composition itself, uh, we can pre-configure a lot of parameters. Uh, this is where you start baking in a lot of those best practices and guardrails and so on and so forth. So we can do that as part of the composition itself. And then when uh, you, the user gives the inputs, let's say in this case, we want to accept the storage GB as an input, then uh, we can uh, merge those user inputs to the actual managed resource that is getting created. So in this case, we are saying, uh, we are accepting storage GB as a parameter from the user. In the GCP case, map the parameter to the data disk size GB on the GCP side, while on the AWS side, uh, map that same parameter to the allocated storage um, uh, on the RDS side, right? So this is how we create different types of compositions depending upon how uh, we would want to uh, create our abstractions. <clears throat> Now, once the compositions are available, the next step is to actually create those uh, resources that we want. So that's when we create a composite resource. A composite resource represents a set of managed resources that will eventually get created in the underlying uh, cloud service uh, uh, provider. So uh, a composite resource provides the required inputs from the user to the composition, and then the composition kickstarts creation of uh, the uh, composite, uh, the managed resources in the underlying cloud uh, provider. So a composite resource can be thought of similar to a custom resource in the Kubernetes world or like a TFRs or a Helm a values.yaml, right? That's how you would relate to a composite resource. So uh, let's say uh, we switch the persona and we go to a developer persona and we want to create a, a resource, then essentially we create a composite resource we're saying that we want an X PostgreSQL instance uh, a database. Uh, and uh, we're saying that, okay, we want 20 GB and the provider is AWS. That's all we are saying. And when we apply this YAML, uh, the respective composition is automatically picked up and the corresponding managed resources are automatically created by Crossplane. Um, there's also another uh, concept called as composite resource claim. 
A composite resource claim is very similar to a composite resource. Uh, it actually one-to-one -one maps to a composite resource and also has the exact same schema like a composite resource, right? Uh, the key difference between uh, XRC, a resource claim, and a composite resource is that typically XRC, the composite resource claim, is used by developers and DevOps teams and platform teams can use the composite resource to create resources, right? And the other key difference is that the composite resource claims are all namespace scoped. They reside within the namespace that is specified. And the composite resources are actually cluster scoped, right? So, but one-to-one, -one, they have a exact same uh, spec and schema and they relate to each other uh, in a one-to-one -one fashion. <clears throat> so how, how does this, all, all these things actually get uh, assembled and you know, when you put together, how does it look like, right? So the first step is the platform team uh, defines the spec through a composite uh, resource definition. And then the platform team can create uh, different uh, compositions uh, which uh, create the actual composite resources. And as a developer, they initiate a composite resource claim to be created by uh, creating a claim, which in turn creates a composite resource. And the composite resource starts creating all the required managed resources in the underlying uh, cloud provider as defined in the composition uh, uh, composition defined by the platform teams, okay? So that's how this whole thing is going to work. Okay, so with that, let's actually jump into a demo where we will see things in action. Um, so um, I've got a, a Kubernetes cluster uh, running on uh, AWS uh, EKS, and I've got it connected to my uh, local and uh, you can see that uh, uh, my cube config is currently connected to that, right? Now, uh, the first step to do uh, is that uh, we can start installing Crossplane. So that can be installed uh, uh, just by using uh, Helm and you know, install the uh, Crossplane uh, Helm template. And once Crossplane is installed, then uh, the first step is to actually uh, uh, install the provider uh, that you would want to enable. So uh, in this case, uh, uh, you can simply say, I want to have a provider AWS to be installed because we are going to uh, deal with uh, AWS primarily. And uh, I've already got that as well installed on the cluster. So if I just say, uh, okay, get uh, uh, providers. Uh, so I've got the provider AWS uh, uh, installed on the cluster, right? Now, um, so let's say we want to uh, create an SQS uh, abstraction where uh, we want to offer an SQS service where developers can create uh, queues on the fly. Uh, so what we will first do is uh, uh, we'll create a composite resource definition for SQS. And uh, we define, okay, it's a composite SQS and it can be claimed by the developer using the name uh, SQS. And we simply define the spec for this particular uh, abstraction that we want to offer. Uh, it's a very simple spec where we simply accept name, region, and the visibility timeout from the uh, end user, right? So that's the first step to define a composite resource definition. Then we define a composition, right? Where uh, uh, we are saying that, okay, uh, that's of composite SQS uh, kind. And in the composition, uh, we are, uh, Redefining the message retention period, and we are accepting visibility timeout region from the uh, user, and that's actually mapped from the user specified parameter to the actual visibility timeout property in the uh, actual underlying managed resource. Similarly, the region is also mapped to the region parameter in the managed resource, right? And uh, so that's the composition. And uh, as a user, when I want to use uh, uh, this composition and uh, create a particular SQS queue, I simply say, okay, I want to create a queue. Uh, the name is uh, whatever demo SQS and the region is US East one and the visibility time mode is 30. And uh, I can also say that, okay, once this queue is created, uh, I want the queue connection details to be available in a particular uh, secret, right? Because my application needs to be able to connect to the particular queue, right? So let's actually go ahead and uh, uh, install all of this. So uh, let's say we first install the 
uh, CRD, right? So let's actually apply the CRD YAML. <clears throat> That should happen. Yeah, so we have got the uh, composite resource definition created. So the next step is to define the, uh, to install the composition. We'll go ahead and uh, actually install the composition. So typically uh, this activity will be performed by the uh, platforms team and the compositions will be available. And then when it's uh, available for the developer, they simply initiate a claim, which actually creates a, a queue, right? So now that the composition is actually available, we can actually go ahead and create a particular queue as well. So before that, let's actually switch to SQS console. So we don't have any queue available here. So let's actually go and say um, SQS claim.yaml uh, to actually initiate creation of a particular SQS queue. So yeah, so there you go. SQS uh, demo is created. If I actually say go kubectl get sqs demo, I should actually see. Yeah, so that I actually have the sqs demo queue created. So what you see here is uh, you now start managing sqs itself from Kubernetes, right? So you now have that custom resource uh, uh, created here itself, and actually can manage uh, that particular queue from Kubernetes itself without even going to the AWS console or using any other tool, right? So if I switch back to my AWS console, uh, a queue should get created in another few seconds, maybe, yeah, there you go, right? So the queue actually has got uh, created. So as simple as that. So now uh, the power of Crossplane now comes into picture where, uh, like I mentioned, you can now manage everything from uh, Kubernetes itself. And because it runs in Kubernetes uh, itself, uh, all the aspects of Kubernetes, like your reconciliation uh, loop, all those things also apply to even this particular cloud resource, right? So let's take, for example, uh, somebody goes and uh, modifies this particular queue where uh, they actually go and change the visibility time out to, let's say, uh, 60 seconds instead of 30 seconds, right? And say, go and save, right? So now, uh, because the, uh, the queue was created from, from Kubernetes through Crossplane, uh, it will it will automatically try to maintain the state as defined in your uh, desired state, right? So the reconciliation loop is always going to uh, keep reconciling and finding out whether there is any change and automatically detect the drift and uh, you know revert that change. So if I actually go back and uh, refresh this, uh, so it's 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 one minute now, and if you give another a few seconds, where the cross plane kicks in and finds out that you know this particular Thing has changed, it will actually revert it back. So let me actually uh, see if that happens. I think we just have to, yeah, there you go, right? So uh, the time out, uh, visible time out has actually come back to 30 seconds as defined in uh, our uh, uh, claim, right? Um, so that is the uh, the key uh, difference between, you know, cross pin and other infrastructure as code tools, right? Where uh, drifts can be automatically detected and automatically reconciled, and you can go back to your uh, desired state as defined in your spec, right? So that was a simple demo. And if you just want to delete this particular queue, we can actually, again, simply delete it from uh, here itself, right? The entire life cycle can be managed from uh, Kubernetes itself. <clears throat> right, so that was a simple demo of how you can use uh, Crossplane to uh, provision uh, cloud service like an AWS SQS right out of your Kubernetes cluster. Now, uh, the next question is, uh, what about pod identities, right? Uh, so now this queue has got created. Uh, how does the application connect to that particular uh, queue? Because it needs uh, credentials uh, to talk to the particular queue, right? Uh, so in terms of AWS, IAM roles or whatever, right? Now, um, every pod, when it wants to connect to a particular uh, cloud service, then it needs to have those fine-grained permissions uh, that are specific to what that particular pod needs to connect to. Let's say there is a pod that connects to SQS, it needs only SQS permission. If there is a pod that needs to connect to, let's say, DynamoDB, it needs to have only that particular permission. So this whole thing needs to be, again, dynamically created whenever the pod comes up, and you need to create those respective IAM roles and policies, and also create those respective uh, service accounts, right? So if you're operating as a platform, then this whole process needs to be again automated, right? So how do we do that? So again, uh, the operators uh, are to the rescue, right? So what we can do is we can actually have 
our own custom operator to manage the whole pod identity aspect, right? So you can have your own custom operator written where what it does is whenever a pod comes up and it, it needs to, let's say, connect to a particular a cloud service, it identifies which service it needs to connect to. It automatically creates those required IEM roles and policies and also creates the required Kubernetes service accounts attached to the particular pod. And you know immediately the pod can actually start connecting to that particular queue, right? Um, so hopefully that gives you an idea of uh, how we can automate the entire infrastructure of provisioning cloud services and even provisioning IEM roles, everything through operators, through a combination of cross-plane and our own custom operators. So in terms of uh, the benefits that cross-plane offers, I think the fun first fundamental benefit is that uh, because we are managing everything through Kubernetes itself, now as, uh, as users, we can use the Kubernetes ecosystem and its tools to even manage cloud resources, right? Uh, you don't have to use another third party tool to, um, to manage cloud resources. The entire state of your cloud resources are available within your Kubernetes clusters itself, right? And that's a, a big advantage in terms of simplifying the entire infrastructure pipelines. And we also saw in the demo where uh, the reconciliation happens automatically so that any drifts that happens in the infrastructure outside of uh, cross-plane is automatically detected and uh, it maintains a desired state as defined in our uh, definitions, right? This is very, very powerful uh, where uh, any drifts is actually automatically rolled back. So uh, that's pretty much it. So hopefully that was useful. Uh, so if you have any follow-up questions, uh, so please do reach out to me. Um, thank you and uh, have a great day.